suit about two and a half hours before liftoff, taking the elevator up in front of Space Shuttle Columbia there. They load us up into our seats one at a time, strap us in with shoulder harnesses and seat belts. So I'm just outside here waiting when it's my turn. They'll say, hey, Don, we're ready for you. I'll turn the corner, walk down that access arm, and at the end of it there, you see the round hatch for the shuttle. Before I climb on board, these two guys in the white suits will help me put on a parachute harness. They'll do a last minute check of all my gear, make sure it looks good. Then I get on my hands and knees right there, we crawl inside the hatch, and they strap us in. Once we're all strapped in, they close and seal that hatch, and everybody moves away from us three and a half miles. It's pretty quiet for us out on the launch pad up until about six seconds before liftoff. At that point, our three main engines start coming up to full power. We're still physically bolted down to the launch pad at that point. Once a computer say those three engines look good, then we light these two side rockets or solid rocket boosters, and as soon as you light them, immediately we take off. And for liftoff, we're laying on our backs in our seats. There's a lot of shaking and vibration as the engines come up to full power. And at the moment of liftoff, when we light those solid rocket boosters, it felt to me like somebody had their hand right in the middle of my back and was just pushing me up into the sky. And that's what the shuttle's doing, literally pushing us, throwing us up in the air. This picture is taken four seconds after liftoff. We're going 120 miles an hour already. So we don't ease off the launch pad. It is literally boom, and you accelerate faster and faster every second. Eight and a half minutes after liftoff, the engine shut down. It's perfectly quiet. Then there's a big boom. We fire some explosive bolts, and the space shuttle would separate from our big fuel tank. That fuel tank would fall back in the atmosphere and burn up like a shooting star, and that would leave us into the space shuttle orbiting the Earth. It only takes eight and a half minutes to get to space. That was always amazing to me. It probably took you eight and a half minutes to get from your car, get your ticket, and to get inside the game. <laughs> so fast that we orbit the Earth in only an hour and a half. So in the 30 minutes, I'm going to speak with you this afternoon. If we were in space, we'd go one-third of the way around the planet during that time. It only takes eight minutes to cross the United States. And the first thing you notice in space is you don't walk around like we're used to doing here on Earth. When you want to move around in space, it just takes a little push with your finger, the smallest little push, and you go sailing through the air like Superman or Superwoman. And you keep sailing until you hit something hit a wall or until you reach out and grab a hold of something and stop yourself. If you like doing somersaults, you can start flipping in the air. And you go round and round all day until you get tired of it and you stop yourself. So does it sound like fun up there? Yeah. It's a blast being up in space. It's a great place. Here's Susan Still, our pilot. And Susan's typing on a laptop computer. And I want to point out one thing. You see how she's got her toes hooked on that gold pole right there? If she didn't hook her toes there, Every time she would hit the keyboard on the computer, what would happen? She would float up in an opposite direction, right? But if she just anchors her toes a little bit, she can stay in position, type away, just floating in the air there all day long. So space is really a fun, comfortable place to live. We have a lot of fun up there. And in space, there's no up or down. We pretty much agree which way is up and which way is down, right? In space, there is no up or down. And you know here on Earth, if you stand on your head or you hang upside down from all the blood rushes to your head because of gravity. And you can feel the pressure like you're going to get a headache from that. In space, without gravity, that doesn't happen. If you go upside down, you feel totally normal. And in space, wherever your head is pointed, your brain says that direction is up for you. And wherever your feet are pointed, that's down. So this is Nancy and Kevin from my second flight. Nancy's looking at Kevin there, saying, hey, Kevin, you're upside down. Well, Kevin's looking right back at her, saying, no, you're upside down. <laughs> His little world there, she's the one that appears to be upside down. If we were in space right now, I could slowly push off, float up there, and I could sit down up there. That would become my new floor. And I would look at all of you and say, you guys are all sitting on the ceiling here. And you'd be looking up at me saying, you crazy astronaut, you're up on the ceiling. <laughs> so however you orient yourself, wherever your head is pointed, that direction is up for you. You never feel like you're upside down, it's everybody else in the room. That just tells you a little something about the ego of an astronaut, right? <laughs> OK, 
okay, in space, we don't have a refrigerator, freezer, a microwave oven, nothing like that. So all of our food is freeze-dried, and it comes in small plastic packages that you can see there. And to prepare these meals, we bring it to this food station. There's a needle that will poke inside that package. We can inject some hot water in there. This dry, hard, freeze-dried food will absorb that water, soften up, and in two or three minutes, it's ready to eat. We just cut these plastic packages open with a pair of scissors and eat it with a normal fork or spoon. For drinking in space, we drink out of these little foil pouches like you see here. If I had a bottle of water in space, I'd take the top off, I'd tip it upside down to get a drink. Nothing would happen. Without gravity, liquid's not going to fall or pull out of a glass or bottle. So we can't drink out of a cup like we used to here on Earth. So we drink out of those foil pouches. They're all powdered juices. We've got powdered lemonade, powdered coffee, powdered tea, all kind of drinks like that. We bring it to that food station. The needle pokes in there. You can inject water. You just mix it up, poke a straw in there, and squeeze it into your mouth. Just like the Capri Sun juice drinks that our kids have in their lunch. Sleeping's a little different in space. The inside of the show is pretty small, and we don't have dedicated bedrooms. So when it was time to go to bed, we just take a sleeping bag, and we would attach it to the wall with a couple of clips that you see there. And then you just float up there, slip inside, zip it up, and you go to bed. We wear the eye shades that you see here because we go around the Earth every hour and a half. You get 45 minutes of daytime, 45 minutes of nighttime. And if you don't want the sun coming in your eyes all the time, you need to wear the eye shades. Most of the astronauts, at least one night, they put their sleeping bag up on the ceiling just so they can come back and tell their friends, you know, one night I slept up on the ceiling. <laughs> You're telling the truth, right? Kind of. Okay, for cleaning up in space, we don't have a bathtub, we don't have a shower, we don't even have a sink like you have in the kitchen or bathroom at home. So when it comes time to clean up, we've got some of those drink bags, and instead of having powdered uh, juice in them, a few of those bags will have powdered soap. We can add hot water, mix up a bag of hot soapy water, and we put it on a washcloth, and you can give yourself a sponge bath. That's how we clean up up there. For washing your hair, we have this special shampoo that you see here called No Rinse Shampoo. And this stuff was developed for people who are in the hospital who can't get out of bed to take a shower. It's very easy to use, doesn't require any water. All you do is squirt this stuff in your hair, you work up a lather, and then you take a towel and pat it dry and you're done. I took this picture, I love the bottom line on it right there. It's a little hard but it says, for beautifully clean, full body hair. <laughs> I just want to share with you what that looks like up there. <laughs> Anybody with longer hair is going to float all over up there. And I'm not picking on Susan here. Even my short hair floats all over. Do you guys believe that or not? <laughs> well, gonna, probably <laughs> and we say that every day in space is a bad hair day up there, and that's pretty accurate. I want to show you the granddaddy of all bad hair days in space, all right? Right here. <laughs> this is Marsha Ivins, one of our shuttle astronauts. She flew on five space shuttle missions. Marsha had really long hair. She wouldn't leave it like this during the mission normally. Otherwise, for the rest of us, it'd be like scooped out if you see me. She put it in a ponytail to get it out of the way. But that's what happens in zero gravity. Anybody know what this is? Do we skip this? Skip it? The 11 o'clock group did not want to hear about this. You guys up for it? Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll talk about it. The shuttle toilet's in a small closet area, maybe four feet across, five feet high. Has a little curtain that goes across the front, like a shower curtain for privacy. And it's got a toilet seat here, like our toilets on Earth. But here on Earth, we use gravity to collect the waste material on the toilet, right? What's going to happen in space? Let's not even talk about it. Yeah. This toilet is kind of like a porta potty. You may see it a football game or construction site, and in the bowl part of the toilet here, we have nine fans. And to go to the bathroom, there's a little white knob right there. You push that forward, it activates these fans, and it sucks the air from the toilet seat downward. So we use this downrush of air in the bowl part of the toilet to kind of act like gravity to keep all the waste material there. There's a little funnel here, and a hose, that's what you pee into, and all the urine gets collected into a tank underneath the floor. There's also a couple places here to put your feet into yourself down so you're not floating a hole. <laughs> More than you needed to know, right? <laughs> and in space, everything floats up there. So if you're brushing your teeth and you want to rinse out your mouth, you can just let go of your toothbrush and toothpaste. You float across the shuttle, you get a little drink of water. And when you come back, they should be floating there right where you let go of them, unless one of your crew members maybe floated by and kicked it with their toilet. So. <laughs> okay, I want to
to show you some uh, pictures of the Earth here. And whenever an astronaut has a free moment, we would go to the window to watch the Earth go by. And I've got a, a map in my hand here. I'm trying to figure out where we are around planet Earth. And I'm looking out one of the windows there to the, towards the tail end of the shuttle. And I took a camera right up to that window, and I took a picture so you can see exactly what my eyes are seeing. And this is the view out the back that we get to see there. So that's the Earth from 200 miles up. All the blue in this picture is the Pacific Ocean, the whiter puffy clouds. Typically these clouds are five or six miles above the Earth, and again, we're flying 200 miles up, so we're well above the atmosphere. Over here, this is Baja, California, looking south. This is the west coast of the mainland of Mexico, so San Diego, California, would just be the upper right-hand corner of that picture. If you look carefully here, you may see a little thin blue line right there, and it continues over here. Any idea what that means? Little hours? It's the atmosphere. Yeah, exactly right. You know, on a sunny day like we have here today, you look up at that blue sky, it looks like it goes on forever and ever. From space, we see the atmosphere catch on, and it appears as this really thin, almost paper thin layer protecting us here on planet Earth. Most of the atmosphere is in that first 20 miles above the Earth. That's it. <coughs> That's why, you know, when we flew in the air, it had such a major impact on our planet. And I think every astronaut who goes to space comes back with a keen appreciation for how fragile planet Earth is, how we have to take better care of this place. Here's a hurricane. I saw many hurricanes and cyclones and tropical storms when I was up there. This was a big storm out over the Pacific Ocean, about 400 miles across. And we flew right over the center of it there, right <coughs> over the eye of the hurricane. And from 200 miles up, I could go to the window, look straight down, and look right into the eye of the hurricane and see the blue water of the Pacific Ocean. The next picture is showing the eye looking straight into it from above, right there. So that's the eye of a hurricane about 15 miles across. You get very light winds in the center of it here, but just seven or eight miles away, that's the eyeball. And this one had winds of 135 miles an hour. Here's a volcano. It's been extinct here. This is in the South Pacific near Indonesia. There's a volcanic crater here half underwater. These are all volcanic islands in that part of the world. And here you see the Himalayan mountains. Right here in the dead center, this is Mount Everest. So right there, that's the very top of Mount Everest. Now I can stand up in front of you today and tell you without lying, I have seen